Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another online lecture for organic chemistry. We're continuing with our ether lectures today as part of the organic two process. And this is a part of the chem complete series for organic chemistry two. And we previously talked about the Williamson ether synthesis and alkoxy mercuration as two potential methods for creating ethers because we're in the middle of the ether chapter right now. And so we're going to look at the really the one and only reaction that ethers undergo and that is that ethers we can undergo acidic cleavage when we deal with eth ethers okay so when we deal with acidic cleavage of ethers we're going to have and i'm going to use a, a somewhat simple example here to start with we're going to have a strong acid and it has to be a very strong acid usually it's one of the halides HCl is actually usually considered to be too weak for ether cleavage. You need HBr or HI in order to do this. So we'll go ahead, we'll use HBr as the general example here. And what's going to happen is the ether is going to act as a base because we have a strong acid present. It'll grab the acidic proton and we will remove the bromine here. So as far as we're concerned, mechanistically speaking, we have protonated the oxygen involved in the ether. And whenever you protonate an oxygen and create this positive charge, this has now become a good leaving group. Now, this might be a little bit peculiar to you because you're probably used to leaving groups just like we have here, a halogen that leaves from some other group it's attached to, or maybe a tosylate. However, we can protonate, and we have seen many reactions where we've taken, and I'll draw this up to the side here, but where we have taken something like an alcohol, an OH group, and we've protonated it into water. So it's become H2O plus, right? Uh, sorry, that would not, that extra set wouldn't be there. And then the water leaves. So when it leaves, we get H2O, and it basically is going from a positively charged state to a neutral state once it leaves. So protonated oxygens, when they have this plus charge, very good leaving groups. Now, again, we're talking about a cleavage here, so what's going to happen is we're going to split apart this molecule at the oxygen. Now, I have the bromine left in solution. Bromine makes an excellent nucleophile. It doesn't make a particularly strong base, and I just wanted to bring this up because... A lot of students have a tendency to say, oh, here's Br minus, so what are we going to do? And they say, well, Br minus, they say one of two things. It's either going to come and grab this proton here. Well, if it did that, that's going to return the ether to us, so that didn't do us any good, okay? But on top of that, it's important to realize that this is a much better nucleophile than it is a base. Now, why is it such a poor base? Because if I look at HBr, Br minus is its conjugate, right? And the general rule is, if I have a strong acid, it's going to have a weak conjugate. So this Br- is not a particularly good base at all. So it's not going to remove acidic protons. The other thing that students have a tendency to do is they want to draw this Br going to the oxygen, because there's a plus charge there. Okay, And I understand this, this draw, where you basically say, let's match the plus and the minus up together, and we'll add this you know, bond to the oxygen here. This oxygen has three bonds and a lone pair as it is. I cannot create the oxygen with four bonds and a lone pair. I'm starting to go past the valence uh, exception. So everything in the second row, including, you know, carbon, oxygen, they can only have up to eight electrons surrounding them. So I can't create a bond here to this oxygen and give it four bonds as well as a lone pair, because then I'm looking at 10 electrons. That's not acceptable. So what's going to happen is that the, this carbon, so there's really a CH3 here, right, on the end, this carbon is going to let go of this entire group to form an alcohol. And when it does that, this is the ether cleavage, the leaving, I'm sorry, the nucleophile, it was a leaving group originally, is going to come in and attack the carbon, because if the carbon is letting go of electrons here to this oxygen, then it needs a replacement, because I can't form a methyl carbocation. 
So what I'm going to have is the BR is that replacement. So this is really an SN2 type mechanism. Okay. And so I, I look here and I say, all right, well, this is the least hindered spot of the two. I have the methyl. So the question is, could it break this way? It could, but here I have an ethyl instead of a methyl. Methyl is less hindered and SN2 prefers attack at the least hindered site. And so the BR comes in at the methyl here. And we'll do another example to show you what we're talking about here. All right. So CH3, BR, because the BR attacked this methyl, plus I'm going to get the corresponding alcohol. So you can almost view this as a reverse of the Williamson ether synthesis. Because Williamson ether synthesis says I need an alcohol and I need an alkyl halide. Now I'm breaking this down and I'm saying, okay, I'm going to get an alkyl halide and an alcohol back from this process. All right. So give you another idea. Let's take a look at, we'll do an ethyl group here. And then let's do like an isopropyl group over here, right? So if I take a look here, I'll use HI this time, hydroiodic acid, another good strong acid. The ether will attack the proton, iodine will leave, and I'm going to get the protonated form of this ether. And then I need to decide which way I'm going to split. So the question is, essentially, where do I want this I minus to attack? Well, it can either attack here, right, or it can attack here because the ether is going to have to cleave at one of these sites. Well, what do I really have here? I have a CH3, right, this dot at the end right here, and then a CH2 at this dot. So that's one option. And then on the other end here, I've got a CH and a CH3 and a CH3. So the question is, which one of these is less hindered, which is more hindered? Well, this is less hindered, and this is more hindered. And so the attack, because it's happening at the same time of this iodine, is going to go to the less hindered position, because again, this is SN2 in nature, and it is going to cleave the alcohol away from where the nucleophile is coming in because this alcohol is acting as a leaving group. So what do I end up with when I finish this? I'm going to get ethyl iodide plus I will get 2-propanol. Right? Which you can also call isopropanol if you're familiar with that terminology. So that is how ether cleavage works. Now, one of the things that's really tricky here, okay, this is SN2 in its mechanism whenever there are only, when there's methyls, primaries, and secondaries. And so what I'm saying is, for instance, this was a primary. The ethyl group here is primary. The isopropyl group here is secondary. So I'm following SN2 mechanics if basically both sides of my ether have only these present. Okay, But if I have tertiaries, allylic, remember that's the double bond one space away, or benzylic, I am going to end up in an SN1 type of mechanism. Now I say type here because a full SN1 leaves a carbocation behind. All right. Um, we basically have partial positive buildup that can start occurring with some of this. So if you take a look and it's, I, I don't want to argue that you can't necessarily have a carbocation with some of this, but the point is the attack site is going to be different when you're looking at this, right? So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So, if I was interested in one where there was a, let's say, a tertiary present, right? In that case, what I'm going to look at is something along the lines of maybe a T-butyl group that's attached to this ether 
and we'll just say a methyl group like this, right? So when I have this type of reaction, the steric hindrance here for the ether is large because of this T-butyl group. So I will proceed with the protonation. However, now I'm going to start following SN1 type of mechanics. So I grab this here. I kick the iodine off, right? And what's going to end up happening is I get the protonated form I'm just drawing that out as an explicit CH3. And so this group can leave, okay? Now, it depends what your teacher wants. I don't know if you want a carbocation there or if you want to show the partial positive buildup. So basically, you could draw a partial positive, right? That's like right here as this is leaving. Um, but we'll go ahead and we'll show a carbocation type of structure here. So as this leaves, I'm going to be left with a carbocation from that T-butyl group and I have the I- minus that is present in solution. That I- minus is going to come into the carbocation and bind there. So before we were having the I- minus attack at the less hindered site like the methyl. Now because there's a tertiary we start switching over to SN1 mechanics because there's a lot of steric hindrance surrounding the ether as a whole. And when we finish this up, we see that it's sort of the reverse effect. Now, I end up with, oops, that was not a bromide, right? I used an iodide. So now I end up with the iodine here, and the less hindered group becomes the alcohol. So this is really a switch from what we were seeing before, right? So if I were to rewrite this, we would say we've got CH3, carbon, CH3. CH3 I attached to that carbon plus your methanol. All right, so let's take a look at one more of these. So this time I'll go ahead and I'll put a benzyl group there. So benzyl group, remember, needs that extra, this spot right here. Okay, and then I will do, we'll do an ethyl. So it's a benzyl versus a primary. And so because I have the benzyl, this large group over here, a particular group that will be resonance stabilized, we can get some carbocation formation. So we use H, we will use the BR this time. Let's use HBR. The ether portionality grabs the proton. The bromine will leave. And then what I end up with is the benzyl functionality next to the protonated ether plus the ethyl group. So now when I get ready to cleave, I want the carbocation to land right there because that's going to have resonance stability. So the cleavage here will occur in this direction to liberate the less hindered side as the alcohol. So what I end up with here is going to be the benzyl group as a cation, right? And so, by the way, this is a very, very common carbocation due to the stability. So anytime you have benzyl groups, if you put them in a mass spec or something like that, a lot of times you'll see this fragment or this ion uh, that comes out. But that's a side note. So when you have this, you've got the Br as the nucleophile. This BR will come in and attack that resonance stabilized, and I'm not showing all the resonance structures here, but there would be several. And so I end up with benzyl bromide plus ethanol, because don't forget I liberated, after that first step, I liberated this alcohol right here that came off as ethanol. And so this is what I would have. So hopefully this makes sense. Uh, just to recap, okay, if I have methyl primary, and we're going to include secondary here. Secondary, possibly you might see some SN1 characteristics because it, it's starting to get a little more 
substituted um, in terms of its how hindered it is. Uh, but tertiary, uh, the benzylic, which I'll abbreviate, and the allylic are most definitely going to be SN1 when we're dealing with ether cleavage. These guys, for the most part, would be SN2 when I'm dealing with ether cleavage. And that's going to affect, so uh, when you have R x plus r o h right in this case the r x this r portion is going to be the less hindered because it's sn2 and the r that belongs to the oh will come from the more hindered side and then here when we have the sn1 when i get an r x plus the alcohol it's going to be exactly the reverse because a carbocation formed so I wasn't worried about getting in as the leaving group was leaving so this now becomes the more hindered because it had to host that carbocation and the alcohol is the less hindered okay and these are the rules again for ether cleavage using a strong acid and that pretty much covers it that's really the only major reaction that ethers are going to undergo when we're talking about regular uh, sp3 hybridized ether functional groups that are in straight chain now what we do have coming up is epoxides and epoxides are very reactive in comparison to regular ethers. They are the three-membered cyclic ethers, and because of that angle strain, they will have all sorts of reactivity that normal ethers do not. So that covers all of the ether reaction portion, and I will see you guys next time, and we will talk about creating epoxides. Uh, I'll refresh your memory on that, and then we will talk about acid and base-catalyzed opening of epoxide rings. So I will see you guys in the next lesson. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to comment and I will get back to you. If you appreciate this video and you like the content, please give it a thumbs up and go ahead and subscribe so you can be up to date on all the latest info. And other than that, I will see you guys for the next lecture. We'll get started on epoxides. See you there.